I'm going to start this message kind of uh, for uh, the church, basically in a practical way. And then it's, this is a two-parter. So the first part, I want to look at Genesis 11:6. 6. Over the last few weeks when I have ministered, the Lord has laid on my heart the message of, of, of being one people and one language where we're all in one accord because Jesus, I mean, I guess this was God that said, uh, Genesis eleven six. 6. Um, let me just give a little background here because I've been teaching on this, so I'm not really going to teach on it a lot, but I want to start from here. And the Lord said, now what he was, when he gives this speech that he's talking about, it's when the people that were created and they were still a kind of conglomerated in a certain area. Uh, this was after the uh, flood and they were deciding that they were going to build a tower that was going to reach into heaven. And uh, God heard about it, the Bible says, and he came down to check it out. And when he came down, he found some things that was going on that I think is relevant to us. And he says this, Behold, they are one people and they have one language. So they were all of one accord. And, this, and listen to what he says. This is only the beginning of what they will do. In other words, he's saying... What they're doing now isn't all they're going to do. As long as they're one person, people, as long as they're one language, this is only just the beginning. They'll just keep doing stuff. That is impossible. And now, he says, nothing they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. Now, when I've been teaching on this, I had, I had made the statement that um, when you're in one accord, nothing is impossible to you. But that's not what God says. He says, when you're in one accord, when you're one people, all saying the same thing, he said, nothing they have imagined they can do. That's a little bit different. Nothing they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. So he's saying that the imagination of this group of people was very important because this imagination propelled them to have visions and have, the, have purposes and, and uh, plans to do something and this imagination is the part that enabled them to develop what they needed to develop in order to do what they thought they could do. So put that back up there. Just, uh, nothing they have imagined <coughs> they can do will be impossible for them. Just leave that up there for a little while. So I begin to talk about, think about, and study about imagination, because I I'm a very imaginative person. Um, it's very I've always been had a strong imagination, and then God tapped into it, and I begin to write uh, Christian fiction. And when I begin to write Christian fiction, I realized how very powerful your imagination is. It is as close to God as you can get. Because when I was writing these stories that I uh, have been writing, I was able to create people. I created people so real that I could have drawn a picture of them. I created situations that were so real that in, one, in Dawn of the Silver Moon, when I was writing one chapter... I was making it up out of my imagination, but I was sitting there crying the whole time because of what was taking place on the page. So imagination is very, very powerful. I looked up the meaning of imagination, and it means images or concepts 
not present to the senses. Does that sound familiar to you? Put up a, a Hebrews 11.1 1 in the Amplified. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it talks about now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Listen to this. Perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. So when we perceive as a real fact what is not revealed to the senses, we're using our imagination, but we're using our faith. So I, I begin to think about that. And as the pastor here, we're in a building program. I think that's scary for any church, especially a leader of the church, because there's a lot involved when you're building. And I wish I'd had them. Uh, there is, any way, is there any way you could put up a picture of our new church just like that? Uh, <laughs> I didn't warn them ahead of time. But... Uh, one day, long, 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 long time ago, this, you can't see it real well there, but a long time ago, this church was just an imagination. You know, Pastor and I had had this imagination for a long, 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 long time. We'd been going for 45 years. And we had this imagination, and we kept... Uh, talking about it, we get planning for it. But one day, we put it down, we had it put down on paper. And so we had an architect drawing. And so now we could see this imagination. And then, one day, we began to build. And it started to become a reality. And so... What we had imagined we could do eventually became a reality. And it's almost, you know, we're going to be moving into it before too long. I don't know when. So just, just keep posted, we'll tell you. We won't leave you out. But here's a, here's a pretty good picture. Isn't that beautiful? Woohoo! Um, so this is, uh, so I have been thinking, you know, we as a church, we must be believing the same thing. So I've been saying uh, things like, um, we're going to build this church debt free. And yet I knew that there were some that was, it, this was hard for them to imagine. And sometimes it felt like it was hard for me to imagine it. And so I got to thinking, you know, I don't think we're all in agreement about this. So what are we what can we get in agreement for? So I, I, I begin to search to see what has God said to me about the church. And one thing that he has said to me was, I will pay for my church. Now that's a little bit different than building it debt free because we have had to uh, tap into our line of credit. But, uh, you know, as soon as money comes in, we pay it off. And so... It's, it's been a great process. But, so I had presented this to the staff, to the leadership, to my prayer, the prayer group, and they all said, yes, I can believe God that he will pay for his church. So I want to ask you, as the rest of our church, can you believe God that he will pay for his church? Everybody that thinks that God will and can pay for his church, say amen. Amen. All right. You heard that, Lord. And then the second thing that he had said to me was in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, where it talks about the blessings. It's actually uh, verse 12. The blessings coming upon a nation. Or a group of people. And he said, if, uh, if you will be very diligent to hear my voice 
and watchful to do what I command you, then these blessings are going to come on you. And this is a part of it. And this is what the Lord brought to my attention. The Lord shall open to you good treasuries, the heavens to give rain in your land. We can believe for that in its season, and to bless all the work of your hands, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. So what the Lord began to show me is this blessings, they overtake you. So I checked my heart. Can I believe that God's blessings will be so uh, magnificent that they will overtake us until we will get to a place as a church, and maybe even individually, where you will be in a position where you can lend and not borrow, not have to borrow. Can you believe for those blessings to come on Victory Center? How many can believe for that? Amen. 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 So what we're doing is we're, we're building an imagination that God can work with. We're all of one accord. We know that there is nothing impossible with God. And if our imaginations can line up with God's word, then there's not going to be anything that we cannot do if we all together can build our imagination. That's right. So this is what I felt in my heart. I was reminded of um, in the, t- the tabernacle in the wilderness. We won't go in. I won't teach very much on this this morning, but... But you know, they left as slaves out of, out of Egypt. And the Bible tells us that when they left, that the Egyptians started giving them things. You know, like silver and gold and stuff. And they went out with a lot of, of goods. And what they didn't know was why this was happening. I mean, they just probably thought, wow, this is pretty neat. But there was no shopping centers. There was nothing to spend the money on. They got out there in the wilderness, and suddenly God says, okay, now we're going to build a church. And so when he said, we're going to build a church, this is what we're going to have to have. And the interesting thing was, one of the things that they needed for this church was dolphin skins. Now, there's two translations that translated it dolphin skins. Now, I can just imagine, here was this little lady, and this Egyptian comes up to her and says, "Uh, I don't have any silver and gold, but I'd like to give you this dolphin skin. And she's thinking, what do I need with a dolphin skin? So she stuck it in her bag and headed out. Several people got dolphin skins. Now, they didn't know why they were getting dolphin skins. Why were they getting dolphin skins? Because God needed those dolphin skins for the tabernacle later on. This is the way God provides. And one thing we are determined is this. We will never put pressure on you to give to our building fund. You are not pressured in any way. God is going to pay for his church. But you know who he's going to use? Is the people out there with dolphin skins. Now, you just happened to have them on hand, and you thought, oh, my goodness. They need a dolphin skin. I've got it here. That's the way God works, and that's the way he's going to pay for his church. He's going to bless you or people out there. I don't know who all. I don't know how he's going to get it, but he's going to get it. And we are going to have a church that we will not have burdens on us financially so that we can do the work of the ministry. So this was number one that God put on my heart, that I wanted to bring all of you into agreement with what the leadership is believing here at Victory Center so God can do what he really wants to do. He wants to do this. He wants to show his hands strong. And so I was praying and I said, God, that's pretty good. You know, I I think this is really neat that you're going to do this for us. I thank you for telling me. Uh, what you're going to do, and we're going to just all believe, and it's going to be great. But I said, Lord, that's not enough. This, just knowing that part, because that building that we had up there on the screen, that building is not the church. That's just 
a structure where the church is going to meet. Because you and I are the church. And the church is not just a physical, be, a, a physical place. The church is a spiritual entity. And so we must have spiritual imaginations as well for our church. For us individually and for our church. We are, there is some spiritual things that God wants to do for us as a church. And this morning I want to build some imagination in your hearts. To, I think another way that we could put it would be expectation. I want to build some expectation. Because when we begin to put this pictures of this church on paper with architectural drawing, expectations started to arise. And it became bigger and bigger until we begin to give birth to it and it began to become a reality. But what I want in this church is not just a church that's paid for, a building that's paid for. I want a church that is filled with the presence of God. I want a church of people that are so on fire for God that it's not just on Sunday. That when you leave this place, that you act just like Jesus when you go into the marketplace. When you go out to your job and you go out with the power and the anointing of God on your life so that when you lay hands on people, they will be healed. That signs and wonders and miracles will be done by your hands. This is really what God wants. Now, I don't know. I, I know if you have not been aware of what God is doing in the land right now, you haven't been on Facebook. <laughs> you may have been under a rock somewhere. But I started... You know, I don't, I don't spend much time on Facebook, but I, I usually scroll through it maybe a couple times a, a day. Just, just, I wonder what's happening, you know, here or there. And I started seeing these posts about Asbury College and uh, the revival that started there. And I mean, my spirit leapt on the inside of me because for, for years... Uh, the Lord's been showing me, and, and I've spoken this over uh, our youth, that God is going to, this last great outpouring that we've been talking about for so long, is going to start with the youth. And uh, every, to my knowledge, the, the great outpourings that I was a part of started with the youth and spread. When it started with the youth, it spread. Now, Pensacola was different. It didn't necessarily start with the youth, and it stayed localized. Now, Pastor and I visited Pensacola. I have experienced the, some of the outpourings of the Holy Spirit. I, uh, I was in the 1970s, whenever the Jesus movement started. That was during that time whenever I, um, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Charlie was baptized in the Holy Spirit during that time. And I have to tell you that I just want to paint a picture of what that was like during that time. During the 70s, nothing seemed impossible. We saw miracles after miracles. People everywhere had expectations beyond our wildest dreams. I know uh, we, Charlie and I, we would pray for people. Uh, I, I can't remember how many times Charlie would pray for uh, people that had one leg shorter than the other. We would, he would pray and we would watch that leg grow out right in front of our eyes, the short one. I said, Charlie, why don't you just pray for both of mine? And let both of mine grow out. <laughs> but, but there was miracles happening. And it was easy. 
during outpourings, there is such a sense of the Spirit of God that you cannot retain any sin in your life knowingly. When I was in uh, college, uh, I went to, uh, I don't know if Sarah's still here, but uh, she plays the keyboard. She's, she has gone to Barclay College, but in those days it was called Friends Bible College. It had a four-year academy, which was four-year high school. I went when I, when I was a sophomore in high school. Then I went to, to the two years of college during that time. Uh, between my freshman year of college and my sophomore years of college, the, there were businessmen in the community that began to have a burden for the college. And so they, uh, they began to have all-night prayer meetings. And I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden, something happened on that campus. I don't remember how it, how it started, but I do know that we as students, all we wanted to do was to pray, worship, or repent. That are, those are the signs of true revival. We would, we would go to the chapel and we would pray and we would sing and we would meet out in the parking lot and we would all get in a circle and join our hands together and we would sing and we would pray and we would meet in the dormitories and have Bible studies and, and somebody was always repenting to somebody else for things that they had held against them. And I mean, it was phenomenal. And I... I experienced something during that time that I will not allow myself to live without. And when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, you know my, a lot of you know my testimony, some of you have never heard it, but I was lying in bed on an Easter Sunday night, and I said, Lord, I want the closest experience I can have with you. And Jesus walked into my room. I saw Jesus, this great light came into my room, and, uh, you know, I had, I had heard about speaking in tongues, I didn't believe in it, and yet, inside of me, there's these words that started coming up, and I said, no, no, God, anything but that, and when I said that, the light was gone, Jesus was gone, and I had a terrible oppression in that room. And I said, get out of here, Satan, in Jesus' name. When I said that, Jesus was back, the light was back, and the words were back. And I was gloriously baptized in the Holy Spirit that night. But having met Jesus in that glory made me hungry that I will never live without that hunger. I am so hungry for more of God. I want a church that's so hungry for the presence of God because it takes care of a lot of stuff in people's lives. So I begin to follow a little bit this this, uh, revival uh, from uh, Asbury, and now I've heard that it's spread to... One account said 18 different campuses. Another said 20. I don't know. I know it's in uh, North Carolina, Alabama, some other places, Texas, in Austin, Texas. But what started out as just a simple chapel service has lasted for 11 days now. And thousands of people are going they're lining up. I think I read at one point that there was a line about a half a mile long waiting to get into that chapel. What does that tell us? People are hungry for God. One son went to, uh, went to visit an Asbury and he came back and his father said, so what made that, that service so special? And he said, because it was Jesus only. It wasn't Jesus and something else. 
It was Jesus only. And I can tell you, when it's Jesus only, your faith grows strong. Because our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is not in how good we can be. Our faith is not in how many scriptures we know and can confess. Those are all good. But our faith is in God. And if we don't know what a good God we have, if we don't know how much God really, really, really loves us, then it's hard to have faith for anything. But our God is such a good God. And you know, he's looking for, he's just looking for a little crack in our religious lives so he can permeate our lives. And let me tell you, if he permeates our lives, we will never be the same. Never. Uh, Larry, would you put a, a I want to show a video. It's a testimony. Uh, it blessed me so much, and I believe it'll bless you. We've been crying out for revival in our city. We've been learning about revival, but I've never seen it. I didn't even know it was real. I'm like, they're, I'm just sitting in class and they're telling us all these stories on college campuses and then going across the nation. And we're like, where, when is this going to happen? And then they lock you in a prayer room and you're just like, hey, you got to ask for it. And we're just sitting there like, God, I'm asking, what, what does it look like? And then all of a sudden, my friend Jaden says, dude, if Jesus just localized himself and just sat his throne in a room, how could we not drive six and a half hours to go see him? And we get here, and we get here, and it was like complete, we get here at like 6 a.m. and it's completely silent. And I'm like, well, um, is this revival, God? And uh, we walk upstairs because we're kind of nervous. We're like kind of shaking already. We didn't get any sleep. Just their terrible road trip partners. They both fell asleep. I drove most of the way. But besides that, we go upstairs and there's people like sleeping. And we're like, so this is revival, God? No. Cool. This, this is awesome. And then chapel starts and immediately we just see people flooding in. And God said, revival isn't hype. It's ordinary people who are hungry. It's ordinary. I'm gonna need you to go to the altar. And I'm like, I don't wanna go to the altar. <laughs> and he's like, go to the altar. And I go to the altar and worship starts. And he's like, this is revival, look left. And I look left and there's this young college woman getting prayed over by an older woman. And he says, look right. And then there's this young guy praying over an older guy. And he says, look behind you. And everyone's just raising their hands. And he said, Gage, this is revival. It isn't hype. It's ordinary people crying out for a move of God in our generation. And I'm here to talk to everybody in this room who is hungry. What an honor. What an honor it is to be here. Revival's real. It isn't just a story we've heard about. It's come. And it's not just come here today, but it's about to spread out to the nation. It's about to spread out to the United States. And I'm here to talk to every young person in this room. I just gave my life a year and a half ago to Christ, and it has been the greatest thing I have ever done. I left everything, and I'm here to talk to every young person in this room. Forget the job, forget the girl, forget the guy, forget everything. He's worthy, he's worthy. And I'm here, and I'm just saying, oh, it's such an honor. If you don't feel that joy inside of you, I don't know what's going on. It's real. Amen. I love you guys. <laughs> Amen. I never I don't know whether to laugh or cry whenever I watch that because I that that just I can feel what he's feeling. I hope all of you can ha have a little bit of an experience on the inside this morning where you begin to feel something bubbling up on the inside of you. It's joy. And maybe, you know, Maybe there's conviction. I don't know. I just know that when you get in the presence of God, 
It's kind of like Isaiah in chapter 6, verse 5. He said he, was, he had a vision and he was high and lifted up and he came into this throne room and there was God. And he stood before God and he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am undone. And so God took, had an angel take a coal from the altar and place it on his lips to cleanse him. And then God said, Who will go for me? And Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. You know, there's a lot going on in the world today. I'm reminded of, uh, I don't know if Jeremiah, I don't see him now, but Jeremiah Gilkey, he's, anyway, he, uh, oh, he's there. I have a reason for that, but uh, how many of you know what happened last Sunday after church? About 5.30, probably about 9.30 when it actually happened. The Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl. <laughs> you say, what does that have to do with your sermon? Well, Bob Jones, years ago, had prophesied that when the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit would take place. And it would bring in the billion soul, one billion soul harvest. Now, I know that they, they won in, in um, 1970, and guess what happened? They had a revival at Asbury in 1970. They won uh, a couple of years ago in 20, and something started shifting. I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with the Kansas City Chiefs. I can't imagine that God would uh, be a Kansas City Chief fan. I mean, if he's a if that happens with the Kansas City Chiefs, just think what would happen if the Cowboys would have won the Super Bowl. <laughs> Brother Hagen always said that, um, you know, they used to have a hole in the roof. Brother Hagen always said, you know why they have a hole in the roof? Because God wants to watch his team play. That's, so that, I mean, I, I don't know if he knew that from a prophecy or what, but anyway... But there is a billion soul revival or a billion soul harvest that needs to be brought in. And I truly believe that there has been prophecies about the end time revival, end time outpouring, the end time church. And I brought uh, with me this morning a uh, vision. Pastor, Pastor Charlie used to read this every once in a while. Probably a lot of you have not heard this. I'm going to try to just skip, skip over a lot of it, but it's pertinent. I want you to hear what has been prophesied over the end time church. And he, this took place in 1961. So uh, Tommy Hicks was a, a missionary or a revivalist that went to a lot of countries and signs and wonders and miracles followed his ministry. But he had a vision in, on July the 25th in 1961, about 2.30 in the morning, and he had this vision. Uh, he, he said he had it three times uh, in the exact same detail. And then he had it again on July the 27th of that year. So he actually had it four times, this same vision, same details. So I don't think that we can discount that. So as the vision appeared to me after I was asleep, I suddenly found myself at a great high distance. Where I was, I do not know. But as I was looking down upon the earth, suddenly the whole earth came into view. Uh, it began to lightning and thunder. And suddenly I beheld what looked like a giant. Um, it was so gigantic and so great in stature, his feet seemed to reach to the North Pole and his head to the South. Its arms were stretched out from sea to sea. As I watched it, I suddenly beheld this great giant. I could see it was struggling for life. 
to even live, but his body was covered with debris from head, head to foot. And at times this great giant would move its body and act as though it would even rise up at times. And when it did, thousands of little creatures seemed to run away. Hideous looking creatures would run away from this giant. And when he would come, become calm, they would come back. All of a sudden this great giant lifted his hand toward the heavens. And then it lifted its other hand. And when it did, these creatures by the thousands seemed to flee away from this giant and go into darkness and into the night. Slowly, this great giant began to rise. And as he did, his head and hands went into the clouds. As he arose to his feet, he seemed to have cleansed himself from the debris and filth that was upon him. And he began to raise his hands into the heavens as though praising the Lord. Suddenly, every cloud became silver the most beautiful silver that I have ever known. And from the clouds suddenly there came great drops of liquid light raining down upon the mighty giant and slowly, slowly, this giant began to melt, began to sink, as it were, into the very earth itself. And as I watched this giant that seemed to melt, suddenly it became millions of people over the face of the earth. They were lifting their hands and they were praising the Lord. At that very moment, there came a great thunder that seemed to roar from the heavens. I turned my eyes towards the heaven and suddenly I saw a figure in white, glistening white. I knew that it was the Lord Jesus Christ. He would stretch forth his hand upon the peoples and the nations of the world, men and women. And as he pointed towards them, this liquid light seemed to flow from his hand into this person and a mighty anointing of God would come upon them. And those people then would begin to go forth in the name of the Lord. I beheld Christ as he continued to stretch forth his hand. But there was a tragedy. There were many people as he stretched forth his hand that refused the anointing of God and the call of God. His hand, uh, he stretched forth his hand towards this one and towards that one and they simply would bow their head and begin to back away. And to each of those who seemed to bow down and back away, they seemed to go into darkness. Blackness seemed to swallow them everywhere. But these people that he had anointed, hundreds and thousands of people all over the world, the anointing of God was upon these people as they went forth in the name of the Lord. They were ditch diggers. They were washerwomen. They were rich men. They were poor men. I saw people who were bound with paralysis and sickness and blindness and deafness. And as the Lord stretched forth his hand to give them the anointing, they became well and they became healed and they went forth. Those people would stretch forth their hand exactly as the Lord did. And it seemed that there was this same liquid fire that seemed to be in their hand. As they stretched forth their hand, they said, according to my word, be thou made whole. And I looked to the Lord and said, what is the meaning of this? And he said, this is that that I will do in the last days. I will restore all that the canker worm and the palmer worm, the caterpillar. I will restore all that they have destroyed. This, my people, is the end time. This, my people, in the end time shall go forth as a mighty army. They shall sweep over the face of the earth. All over these, the world, these people went, and they came through fire, through pestilence, through famine. Uh, neither fire nor persecution, nothing seemed to stop them. Angry mobs came to them with swords and with guns, and like Jesus, they passed through the multitude, and they could not find them. But they went forth in the name of the Lord, and everywhere they stretched forth their hand. The sick were healed, the blind eyes were opened. They, there was no long prayer. These people were ministering to the multitudes over the face of the earth. Tens of thousands, even millions, seemed to come to the Lord Jesus Christ as these people stood forth and gave the message of the kingdom, of a coming kingdom in this hour. These men and women were of all walks of life. Degrees will mean nothing. I saw these workers as they were going forth over the face of the earth. When one would seem to stumble and fall, another would come and pick them up. There was no big eye and little you, but, but they seem to have one thing in common. 
There was a divine love that seemed to flow forth from, from these people as they went together, as they worked together, as they lived together. Jesus Christ was the theme of their life. There were times when great delusions of this liquid light seemed to fall upon great congregations. And that congregation would lift their hands and seemingly praise God for hours, even days, as the Spirit of God came upon them. Then there was another loud clap of thunder. I heard a voice. The voice seemed to speak. Now this is my, this my people. This is my beloved bride. The graves were op I looked upon the earth and the graves were opened and people from all over the world, the saints of all ages, seemed to be rising. They seemed to be forming again this gigantic body. This body suddenly began to form and take shape. It took shape again in the form of this mighty giant, but this time it was different. It was arrayed in the most beautiful, gorgeous white. Its garments were without spot or wrinkle, as the body began to form. My eyes suddenly turned to the far north, and I saw seemingly destruction. Men and women in anguish and crying out and buildings in destruction. Then I heard again the fourth voice that says, Now is my wrath being poured out upon the face of the earth. From the ends of the whole world, the wrath of God seemed to be poured out, and it seemed that there were great vials of God's wrath being poured out upon the face of the earth. I shook and I trembled as I beheld the awful sight of seeing cities and whole nations going down to destruction. I could hear the weeping and the wailing. I turned my eye into the body, arrayed in a beautiful white garment. Slowly, slowly, it began to rise from the earth. As it did, I woke. I had seen the end time ministry, the last hour. Whew. I think we're getting close. I'm thinking that it is not it is time for us to seek God and there's no time for us to be playing around in the world. I think that God is preparing his bride right now. And I definitely want to be a part of it. And I want Victory Center, people that come to Victory Center, people that are part of Victory Center, I want this to be their goal in their lives. Not all the other stuff. Yeah, there's stuff that's okay. But priority. This is our priority in this day. I can't tell you how much time we have left, but I'll tell you this. We are seeing what has been prophesied. We are seeing what the, the Bible tells us is going to take place before the end times, before the last day. We're seeing it right before our eyes. And I remember uh, this was probably, I, I did not write down the date, but this would be quite a few years ago. Uh, when J.J. Heffley was um, our youth pastor. So I'm not sure how long ago that was, but it was many years ago. But they had an encounter uh, coming back from Youth America with the youth that year. And I, I want to read to you what took place. When our youth was returning from Youth America... J.J. Heffley related this extraordinary encounter he had while gassing up the church van on their trip home. And it was actually at Brian's Corner where they were gassing it up. As the youth group was returning from Youth America, we stopped to get gas at Brian's Corner. An elderly man approached me and said he was a truck driver and that the Lord had told him to pull into the gas station to tell me something. He said that God has big plans for Victory Center, that God has heard the prayers of our church, and consequently there is coming a spiritual explosion. He said that the walls would not be able to hold the people. This, he said, would happen among both the youth and the adults. He went on to say that I should tell Pastor Charlie that his vision is going to happen. 
He mentioned Ezekiel 20, 37 about the dry bones and, and uh, how he breathed life into him as part of the vision. He also said that we should not look to other revivals such as Brownsville because it would be different. After he was done talking, he turned around and walked off. Now, he didn't say he disappeared. But I'm wondering, was, was that a message from heaven? But I'll tell you what it is. It's for us to create an imagination for this church. An expectation for this church. And I'm telling you, I will not be satisfied till I see this take place in Victory Center. Why? Because I want to be part, I want our church to be part of the billion soul harvest. That's what it's all about. And I don't know if you was able to hear all of that testimony of that young man, but the one thing that stood out to me, he said it wasn't hype. It wasn't hype. It was just ordinary people seeking God and getting a touch from God. I want to read, uh, close this morning with Ephesians, uh, the third chapter, the 20th verse in, in the Passion Translation. Just uh, put that up there. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your what? Wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power. Is that all of it? Constantly energizes you. I believe that he's going to go infinitely beyond our wildest imagination. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. 